I didn't take over and I did have a little accident. UK households spend about £9,000 a year on transport and as one of our biggest expenses you'd think that every journey should be a joy and delight but unfortunately we know that's not the case. Travelling is rarely as simple as moving from A to B and that's because with every journey we're making a ton of decisions. Decisions aimed to reduce cost, stress, faff and those decisions are based on things like our mood, the weather, even the day of the week. Basically how we perceive the world. And it's up to researchers, like those here at Pearl, to understand how we perceive the world. And here they can create thousands of environments to do just that. We're here at Pearl to find out how they're hacking the senses, and this is The Fully Charged Show. Well, PEARL is uh, it, an acronym. It stands for Person Environment Activity Research Laboratory. Uh, we look at how people do things in an environment and we try and understand how their whole body system responds to the environment and how the environment responds to them as a person and then how we design the environment. This is a very complex um, thing to, to look into and to analyze um, and uh, humans uh, make decisions and um, ha when it comes to situation awareness for instance they, they follow different stages in order to, to act or react to something. So for instance uh, they perceive things so they, the, the first stage is perceiving where, where you are actually collecting data from the environment and there you make use of your senses you make all of make use of all of your five senses and then you you analyze those um, information that you have collected in the stage two which is comprehension and in a stage three you make use of those information to make predictions about what is happening next um, so understanding what sort of information human collect when they are moving within the environment in our cities is the first thing we look into. Based in Dagenham, the Pearl Research Facility is used by a whole host of people, from scientists, engineers, architects, psychologists and economists. Basically anyone concerned with how people interact and perceive the environment around them. So the lab is set up to study exactly that, and it needs some pretty clever tech to do so. From lights that can recreate any lighting profile anywhere in the world, covering a spectrum so large that normal cameras can't capture it. Floors that move to create different spaces, and a sound system that is so sophisticated, it can make it feel like there's a train moving through the building. But when we visited, researchers were using the space to find the perfect sound for an electric scooter. So the noise of the scooter needs to have a couple of characteristics. It needs to be loud enough that we can hear it and we need to know where it exists in space so that as a pedestrian we can move out of the way or as another road user. And we can find that perfect noise by looking at an area called the frequencies of opportunity. Now these frequencies, they leverage something called the cocktail party effect. And we all will have experienced this. This is when, imagine you're in a very noisy room filled with conversation, but if you hear your name across the room, your ears immediately pick up. And this dates back to a time when we needed to be aware of predators chasing us, and we might hear a twig snap uh, somewhere over our shoulder. Scooters are not predators, but we do need to be aware of their presence. Um, and we need to know that we can react in time, subconsciously, so that we're not jumping or leaping out of the way as they arrive. And that's critically important, not only so that we can move safely out of the way and create a safer environment for all road users, but actually improve their perception so they don't seem some kind of public menace, but seamlessly slot into life on the roads. What you can see may not look like much, but this experiment is set up to recreate different sounds of a scooter as if it was traveling behind you. Using an array of speakers at different distances, they can test various frequencies of sound and background noise so they can see which ones are most easily located, even with your back turned. So the background noise that we're about to hear is Tottenham Court Road. 
and that gives the general soundscape of a noisy city environment. Okay, and then I think we're going to start hearing some possible uh, scooter options. So I know that that one is coming from somewhere over there. I can feel that one sort of oscillating. It's quite a pulsy sort of noise. That one is definitely over there. I think that was a closer one, maybe f number three, five meters away. And the same one, but coming over the, from there. Um, so some of those noises didn't actually sound that pleasant, and that's not really the point of this whole experiment. The point is to try and find the perfect frequency that alerts you to the right degree. So at the beginning we heard pink noise, which is really, really good for that sense of perception. Where in space is that noise coming from? Conversely, you have something like an ambulance, which is, is purely there for awareness and, and prioritises sound and noise and loudness over anything else. So once we've found that perfect frequency, then we can start to tailor the noise for the perfect scooter sound. Once the engineers have found the perfect frequency, they can begin to design the actual sound that fits the criteria they've identified. By understanding what's going on subconsciously in our brains, they can make super thoughtful technical solutions. But it's not just sound. There are countless other ways that the team can use creative and psychological hacks to trick our minds in a way that could make things a little more efficient. We are yet to do this in, in this building, but we have done some preliminary experiments before, where, for example, if I made the light pink, you would think the temperature was about two degrees higher than it is. So we are using that in design, for example, of public transport systems, so things like buses, real issue with buses at the moment. We want electric buses because they have no emissions at the point of use and all, it's all grand, all really great. But um, diesel buses have massive amounts of waste energy which you can use to heat the bus. So if you take the diesel motor out and you just have an electric motor, you don't have any of that waste energy. So the energy to heat the bus has to come from the same source as the energy to drive the bus. And so if you um, heat the bus more, you drive it less. So we've been looking at how do we get people to feel as comfortable on the bus when the temperature is lower than it would have been so we can reduce the amount of physical energy required to get the physical temperature. What we did find, um, we had these poor unfortunate people going around on buses at 10 degrees. <laughs> but what was really interesting, you have, you have a bus at 10 degrees, but well, it's 10 degrees outside, and um, if their feet were cold, even if I heated the bus to 24 degrees, they would still feel they wanted it warmer, it wasn't comfortable, they didn't like it, because their feet were cold. So when we moved the heat source from the ceiling, which is where it is in most buses, to the floor, we could heat the bus to 15 degrees, and they felt it was warm enough. So it's, and that's because we are sensitive to the temperature in our feet. So as well as traditional types of mobility, the team here at Pearl are also looking at things like autonomous vehicles and electric vertical takeoff and landing. And as highly automated systems, it's really critical that we understand how these need to interact with people and in the environment. And that's important because we only have one chance to integrate those into our cities right for the first time. So I'm here in the Intelligent Mobility Lab at Pearl to find out just how self-driving systems need to interact with people. Our research basically focuses on the support that uh, humans would require, human drivers would require, when it comes to um, transition of control uh, from the vehicle to the human driver or uh, vice versa. Uh, and this might happen at times unexpectedly, so the, the car may seek unexpectedly um, to hand back the will to the driver. And it's 
quite important uh, that this transition happens in a timely manner and the driver uh, does the correct action in a safe manner and execute that activity correctly so that we don't uh, face crashes or accidents uh, that um, results in um, deaths or disastrous outcomes. Right, so I promise you this isn't a prank, but what we're going to do is put on an EEG hat, uh, which is this rather strange looking contraption, which this looks like a, a swimming hat. Um, and inside, actually, this is worth seeing, there are 32 different sensors, and each of these are going to be measuring the sort of electric signals in my brain. So let's see. I think we're also getting some eye tracking glasses. So I'm looking cracking. Um, these glasses, they have a camera right here, so I can actually, and I'm sure we'll be able to see the video over there, I'm looking straight down the camera lens. And there's also a number of infrared sensors, so these glasses can tell exactly where it is that I'm looking. Um, now, the reason that I've got this on is because when a human is interacting with an autonomous vehicle, it'll be very, very easy to just have a momentary lapse of concentration and to sort of zone out. And I'm sure that lots of people, whether they admit it or not, probably do this a little bit on the motorway. But when an autonomous vehicle needs to hand over control to the human, it's really critical that that human doesn't just sort of burst into sort of control and, and panic and, and make some unsafe maneuvers. So the team here are understanding what's happening in your brain and where. Um, and that's what this, these sensors are measuring on my brain um, and seeing when the car should react to prompt me to, to concentrate. Within our research, uh, we look into multiple things. We look into um, behavior and psychological uh, sensors. We use them in order to collect information from the brain and then uh, also look into eye tracking uh, data to see how humans are making decisions and get inspirations from that. Uh, uh, to replicate that in autonomous cars, but at the same time to understand whether the driver is engaged in the task of driving because they need to be situationally aware uh, of um, the environment uh, while they're driving or when it comes to taking back control. Uh, so what you're quite often familiar with is visual and audio feedback. Yeah. Uh, within our group, we go beyond that and we look into haptic feedback. We have um, developed a driving uh, seat uh, made of um, haptic, uh, haptic uh, structures embedded on the sides. And through that, we will we'll try to provide tactile information and uh, to indicate to the driver that now you need to come back to the loop of driving and now you need to take back control. So what's going to happen now is that we're going to go through the autonomous uh, driving sort of simulation and how I respond to those situations is being measured by what's going on in my brain and, and where I'm seeing, what I'm seeing and how I'm responding to all of those situations. Now once we go into autonomous driving mode, um, there may be a situation where I'm required to resume control and the team here are trying to see what does that process look like and how can we do it in the safest manner possible. So let's give it a go. We're driving and I, I don't need to touch the wheel at all uh, and I assume there may be some sort of dangerous scenario that I need to be a, a made aware of at some stage so we'll see oh and there we go and there it is so I've had a audio signal a visual signal and also got a little nudge um, from these uh, actuators at the side of the seat as well and I have completely lapsed concentration and gone into the bush the reason we are actually looking into haptic feedback is because it is more intuitive. And if we want this human-machine partnership to work successfully and, uh, and be accepted by the society, we need to look into more intuitive types of feedbacks, which requires minimum amount of learning mm. uh, from the people. And, um, sense of touch is a very powerful uh, sense and it has proved to be very effective when it comes to transfer of information to humans. So driving is a visual task, so we definitely would require visual feedback and of course audio, audio feedback. Uh, but then combining it with another type of 
feedback, we are aiming to optimize uh, the level of information that is transferred to the, uh, to the human and make it as intuitive as possible so that this partnership can happen in the most successful way possible and in the smoothest way mm. possible. Why is it important that we get this right now, do you think? If you want to deploy um, robots into our society and expect, them, uh, expect people to engage with them, we need to make sure that this human-machine partnership um, is working successfully, smoothly and seamlessly. Um, and in order to do that, one of the rising questions are, are these humans trusting these systems? Uh, and why are they not trusting them? Maybe they are not close to what, how they make decisions. Maybe they are not uh, able to understand what this machine is going to do. And therefore, they are confused about what to react, how to react and how to interact with them. So it's quite important uh, to extend our knowledge about the complex, uh, um, complex field of interaction between human, machine, uh, human and machines so that we can um, make this uh, relationship uh, trustworthy, safe um, and also timely um, and, uh, and be successful in achieving our goals for the society and integration of these systems into our urban transport systems. This has been a fascinating insight into a mind-bogglingly different world. And it has been incredibly cool to see not just the technologies that are solving our uh, future mobility challenges, but all of the tricks that can be found by really, really, really understanding people and all our weird and wonderful ways. It's been incredible and we have only just skimmed the surface of some of the stuff that's going on in that incredible building. So. If you've liked what you've seen today, please do like, comment or subscribe or even support us on Patreon. It really, really does help us come and visit incredible places like this. And as ever, if you have been, thanks for watching. Well, if you enjoyed that one, I think this video is going to be really relevant, very important. That is our latest video, just come out there. Up here, you can support us on Patreon if you like. Have a look, no commitment. And there, of course, you can subscribe, which costs you nothing.